Wonderful. Wonderful. Well, gosh, thank you so much, everyone, for joining us this morning or, or afternoon, uh, depending on, on where you are. My name is Shalini Upu. I am Director of Admission at Reed College, and it's my treat and my distinct pleasure to welcome you all to this uh, faculty office hours session this morning with Professor Matt Pearson, who is in our, hey Matt, who's in our linguistics department here at Reed. So the way this will work for the next, you know, maybe half an hour, 40 or so minutes, uh, you all, Matt will give a little bit of an overview of the linguistics department, uh, as well as his research and kind of teaching at Reed. Uh, and then we'll open it up to, of course, some questions that you all might have. If you do have questions, there's a chat function that you can just uh, kind of text them, chat them to, to our group, and we'll get to as many as we can. If we can't, if we're not able to in the time that we have, I promise you somebody from our team will get in touch with you and, uh, and answer your questions there. But um, anyway, so, so again, thank you all for joining us. If there are any admitted students here, a very special congratulations on your admission. Uh, oh, hi there. <laughs> congratulations. Welcome. Uh, and, uh, and Matt, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you for-, for Okay. Thanks, Shalini, and, and welcome, everybody. Uh, so, um, uh, hi, uh, I'm Matt Pearson, uh, and welcome to the Faculty Office Hours for Linguistics. So, uh, I'll just tell you a little bit about, about the department and a little bit about uh, myself. Um, so, uh, first of all, you, you might uh, already be aware that Reed College is one of the only small liberal arts colleges to even have a linguistics program. Uh, we've actually got a full-fledged uh, department here, so uh, we're kind of special in that respect. Um, I'm actually a Reed graduate myself. I, uh, I came to Reed in 1988, and at the time, uh, linguistics had just been established as a major, so I was one of the first crop of students to write a thesis in linguistics. Um, after graduating from Reed in 1992, I went to UCLA and did my graduate work there. Uh, so I was in Los Angeles for about about ten years, uh, and then and I taught also for a year in Wisconsin, uh, and then I had the opportunity to come back to Reed as a visiting faculty member about ten years after I graduated. Uh, so that was very exciting for me. Uh, it was a uh, it was an interestingly different experience being a Reed faculty member versus being a Reed student. Um, but I, uh, I came back as a visitor. I was uh, at Reed as a visitor for a few years, and then I got hired uh, permanently around the same time that we developed a linguistics department. Uh, prior to that, there had been a linguistics major, but there was no department. We were kind of interdisciplinary. But now we have a full-fledged department with uh, three faculty in it. So uh, um, the... As, as you may know, it, it, uh, I, I don't know how much you guys know about linguistics, sort of what linguistic is. Uh, it's essentially the scientific study of human language, right? So we look at questions like, um, how does language uh, uh, arise in the individual? How is language structured in the mind? Uh, and uh, how is language sort of used to create social relationships? Questions of that sort. Uh, in our department, uh, the areas that we tend to focus on include uh, syntax, uh, which has to do with uh, sort of looking at patterns of sentence structure, uh, semantics and morphology, which deal kind of with word structure and with meaning. Uh, those are sort of the areas of the department that I cover. And then my colleagues, who I'll talk about in a minute, uh, uh, cover areas like phonetics and phonology, which sort of deals with studying and measuring the sounds of the world's languages. Uh, and uh, also uh, sociolinguistics. Um, so looking at things like uh, dialect differences, how uh, language uh, relates to kind of social categories like gender and race and ethnicity and the region of a country that you're from, that sort of thing. So those are kind of the areas that we tend to focus on uh, in, in our department. Um, so a little bit about me. Uh, so. Um, I'm a syntactician, so my main focus is on sentence structure, looking at sentence structure. Uh, and uh, some uh, people who work on syntax, they are, there are particular phenomena that they're interested in, and they kind of look at a bunch of different languages to study that phenomenon. Other uh, syntacticians are interested in a particular language or a language family, and they might study lots of different phenomena within that language or language family. And I'm kind of in the latter camp. 
So I work on a language called Malagasy. I don't know if any of you have heard of Malagasy or if you know where it's spoken. Uh, so uh, this is the uh, language that's spoken on the island of Madagascar off the east coast of Africa. Um, there's about 14 to 16 million people who speak this language, but it's not very well studied in uh, the linguistics literature. There are only about three or four of us uh, uh, syntacticians who work on Malagasy, so we're kind of a small group who are interested in this language. Um, I'm interested uh, mostly in things like word order. I'm, Malagasy has some unusual word orders that are very different from uh, other languages that you might be more familiar with. Um, and certain phenomena related to how verbs work in the language and, and how questions are formed in the language and a few other things like that. Um, and I, I tend to do my work using what's called a, an elicitation method, which means that I sit down with people who are native speakers of Malagasy. They grew up speaking the language. They, they use it on a daily basis. And I sort of ask them questions about the language. I, I um, construct uh, uh, sort of hypothetical sentences of Malagasy and ask them to judge, do these sentences sound grammatical to you? Do they sound ungrammatical? Uh, and I kind of look for patterns uh, in the data and then try and come up with theories to explain those patterns. Um, and I can talk a little bit more in detail about that if you want me to, but that's just sort of a general overview of what I do. I, um, um, most of the Malagasy speakers that I work with actually live in North America. They live in, in the Montreal area. So uh, a lot of my work involves going to Montreal and meeting with Malagasy speakers there and, um, and interviewing them uh, to gather my data. Um, uh, and, uh, the, the courses that I offer at Reed focus primarily on uh, issues related to sentence structure. So I teach our introductory and advanced syntax classes. Uh, uh, I teach a class with a very fancy name, Morphosyntactic Typology, uh, which is really just a class that talks about sort of the grammars of the world's languages and kind of how diverse languages are and also, but also looking at uh, language universals. So particular kinds of um, structural properties that might be the same across languages and try, sort of trying to understand why it is that languages can vary in their structure in some ways, but why they are also alike in their structure in some ways. Um, and then I also teach courses on uh, morphology, which deals with word structure, semantics, uh, and I, I uh, co-teach our uh, introductory course, uh, and also our field methods course, which is a course that's, which is kind of a lab practical course where you get to work one-on-one uh, -on -one with a speaker of a language that you don't know anything about to do this kind of elicitation work that I was talking about. Um, I've got two colleagues in the department, so we're a very small department. We only have three people in our department. Um, uh, one of my colleagues is named Kara Becker, uh, and she is our sociolinguist. So she, uh, her training is in what is called dialectology. So she's interested uh, in particular in dialects of American English. Uh, she wrote her dissertation about um, the variety of English that's spoken in New York City uh, and sort of looking at how people kind of make use of their New York City dialect to, to achieve particular kinds of social effects. Uh, and she's also worked a lot on African American varieties of English as well. Uh, and she teaches classes on dialectology uh, and also classes on um, uh, language, sex, sexuality, and gender. Uh, that's a, a topic that she's very interested in. She teaches a course on African American English uh, as well. Um, and uh, she also teaches a course called Contact Languages, uh, which is a course about uh, what happens when speakers of different language communities come together. Uh, so that course focuses on things like uh, bilingualism and how the grammars of languages can influence each other, um, how uh, trade and contact languages like pigeons and creoles can arise, how mixed languages come to be, uh, those kinds of topics as well. Um, so essentially anything to do with sort of uh, language as a uh, uh, as a social thing, Lang language as sort of something that informs us as members of societies or members of social groups. Uh, Kara kind of covers uh, classes that have to do with that. And then my, my other colleague is named Samir Udola Khan, uh, and he is our phonetics phonology person, right? So we have 
a, uh, a rather nice uh, phonetics lab in our department uh, that has a soundproof booth where people can make high quality recordings and various kinds of equipment for uh, measuring what's going on in people's mouths and, and throats when they're producing different kinds of sounds. And Samir runs that lab and teaches courses related to phonetics. And he also teaches sort of more theoretically oriented courses about phonology. So sort of looking at um, what it is that we know about the sounds of our languages and how we can study uh, that knowledge. Uh, so he's kind of the sound guy in, in, in the department. Um, let's see, what else can I tell you about our department? So we're a very small department, as I've, as I've indicated, but we have a pretty large number of majors for how small we are at Reed. Usually there are about eight or not, between eight and 10 students who are writing a thesis in linguistics in any given year. Um, and uh, um, so that's a, that's a fairly large number for a, for a, a, a department uh, uh, as small as ours. Uh, so we're a pretty popular major. Um, and uh, we do our best to sort of develop a nice sense of community amongst our students, which I think is something that is, um, you know, really advantageous about coming to uh, a small school like, like Reed. Uh, you're kind of part of a small family, part of a small community within, you know, what is also the small community of Reed. Um, uh, we, uh, you know, we encourage our students to work together on projects. There are some, I don't do this myself, but my, my colleagues, um, have, uh, summer projects that they work on where they hire students to be, uh, research assistants. Uh, so there's some opportunity for faculty student collaboration on research as well. Uh, we try and have, um, at least one or two social events every uh, semester, we bring in uh, outside speakers to give talks on topics that um, you know we are not able to cover in our classes, so that our students can get some exposure to um, sort of what what's going on in the world of linguistics outside of Reed. Um, we have linguistics themed uh, parties and movie nights from time to time, um, and. Um, uh, as I mentioned, we have a lab space as well where students can also uh, gather to work on projects together or to tutor each other. Um, so um, our students get to know each other pretty well, I think. Um, and um, uh, especially the, the juniors when it comes time for them to work on their qualifying exam together or the seniors when it comes time to working on their thesis really develop some nice uh, ties with each other. Um, all right, I think I'm going to stop uh, giving a spiel uh, and open it up for questions because um, uh, I would, you know, I'd, I'd rather that this sort of be directed by what you guys don't know about linguistics or don't know about read or don't know about linguistics at read that you want to know more about. So uh, let me open things up for, for some questions from you guys. I, if I if I might exert uh, a moderator privilege here and, and sure. ask that, um, can you can you talk about some of the ways uh, you specifically used students in your research or in any projects that you've been involved in? Hmm. Well, to be honest, I haven't done as much of that as my colleagues have. Um, so maybe I should talk about their work rather than my own work. So there's there's a. Um, a multi-student, multi-faculty project that's going on in the department right now. Um, I'm, I'm kind of the only one in the department actually who's not involved in this project um, on what is called creaky voice. And creaky voice is a phenomenon whereby um, you, uh, um, uh, in order to lower the pitch of your voice, you can do um, something to your vocal folds that creates this kind of, of um, Quality. It's sometimes in, in, in popular culture, it's sometimes called vocal fry, although that term is, is a, bit of a, a, a bit of a misnomer. Um, and the, the, this uh, group of faculty and students are kind of working together to sort of try and understand how creaky voice is used by speakers of English. Uh, and there are all sorts of uh, dimensions to this. So, so uh, creaky voice is a phenomenon that in the popular culture is associated with young women, young, young straight cisgender women. 
uh, tend to be stereotyped as, as using creaky voice. So one of the things that this project is trying to understand is, is that true? Is it young women who do creaky voice or is it, you know, do, does everybody do creaky voice to some degree? And I think some of what they're discovering is that creaky voice is actually more prevalent than the popular mythology about this uh, would, would lead us to believe. Uh, and that people use creaky voice in different ways, um, uh, whether as a form of uh, gender expression or emotional expression, that kind of thing. And um, so this, this project involves both Kara and Samir and also a faculty member who was a former uh, visitor, visiting uh, professor uh, in our department, who's now at uh, University of California at Santa Barbara. Uh, and every summer they uh, hire students to work with them on this project. They're basically uh, doing uh, uh, multi-level interviews with uh, uh, people of all different ages and all different gender expressions. Um, where they they put them through a particular kind of interview um, uh, um, protocol to gather uh, uh, recordings of them producing speech and then they analyze that speech to see where are they using creaky voice and what are they using it for um, so that's one thing that a lot of our students have become involved in I'm seeing some other questions um, popping up, so let me let me tackle those one at a time. So I see from Danielle, we have a question: What would research study abroad look like for linguistics majors? So we have a number of our uh, majors who do study abroad as part of their time at Reed. Um, we tend to recommend for our majors that they do study abroad for a single semester rather than an entire year. Uh, both because it sort of will, you know, kind of keep them more as members of our community and because it's easier to meet all of your course requirements uh, if you're doing um, just a single semester abroad. But we very much encourage students to do that. Our students tend to do study abroad in their third year, um, although some do it in the second year. Um, and we've had students go to a variety of different places. Um, we have a, a, a student doing study abroad in Taiwan at the moment, uh, kind of brushing up on his Mandarin, uh, and uh, also having opportunity to learn, uh, to take courses in, in um, uh, Chinese history and literature. Uh, we've had a lot of students who've gone to France, Spain. Where else have we had people go? We had one student who did a semester study abroad in Beirut. She had, uh, Reed does not have an Arabic department, but we do, uh, Reed students are able to take Arabic classes through uh, a, a sort of collaboration with Lewis and Clark College, which is another liberal arts college here in Portland. Uh, we kind of, Reed and Lewis and Clark kind of share a small Arabic program. And so some students are able to take Arabic language classes. And we've had students go to places like uh, Egypt and Morocco and this one student who went to Beirut, uh, Lebanon, uh, to sort of further study Arabic there. We have uh, one of our thesis writers this year uh, is writing their thesis on uh, Turkish sign language. And uh, they became interested in that topic uh, as a result of having done a study abroad for a semester in Istanbul, Turkey where they, at, at a university there called Boazici University, which happens to have a linguistics department. So they were able to uh, take some linguistics courses while they were in Turkey. And one of the, a couple of the courses that they took were about Turkish sign language by one of the, the, you know, the leading experts in the world on Turkish sign language. And that kind of got them really interested in the topic. And so uh, we've, you know, we've had students uh, like that who've, uh, sort of incorporated their study abroad experience into their um, uh, in, into their their um, uh, thesis research. Um, that's that's a little bit unusual. Typically, when students do study abroad, it's to it's to improve their their language ability and to get some you know some exposure to another culture and some opportunity to to really make use of their language skills in an immersion situation. So we kind of encourage our students to think about study abroad as more of a cultural experience than an opportunity to learn more linguistics. But some of our students do, do manage to take linguistics courses uh, while they're doing study abroad, or and a, a, a lot of times they will get inspiration for their own linguistic research by their study abroad experience. So that's pretty common. Um, 
Another question, this one from Samantha. Um, is it necessary to learn another language while studying linguistics? Do, you, do we need to know another language already? No, you don't need to know another language already. Um, uh, that said, uh, Reed's uh, linguistics program has a pretty hefty foreign language requirement. So we do expect you to study foreign languages as part of a linguistics major. Uh, the linguistics major uh, at Reed requires that you have uh, uh, actually two foreign languages. Uh, one foreign language at uh, the second year college uh, proficiency level and a second language at the first year college proficiency level. So um, some of our students come to read having already taken foreign language in high school or uh, they may have even taken college foreign language classes or they may have done a study abroad. Uh, as part of their high school experience. So they might come in actually knowing a fair bit of a particular foreign language, in which case they can meet some of our requirement by doing a placement exam. Uh, every fall, the language departments offer placement exams for new students to determine, you know, which, you know, so say someone is coming in and they already know some Spanish, but they're not sure, should I be taking first year Spanish, second year Spanish, or third year Spanish? they'll take a placement exam and the placement exam result will determine which class they start in. So if somebody comes in knowing a lot of Spanish and they place into third year Spanish, for example, then they're counted as already having second year proficiency in that language for purposes of our major requirement. Um, in which case they might just want to be taking classes in another language. But we certainly don't require anybody to have, uh, to know another language already. Uh, uh, as part of our major. Uh, we've got some excellent foreign language uh, programs here at Reed where, you know, you can study, um, you know, the, the usual suspects, uh, uh, French, Spanish, German. Uh, we also have an excellent Russian department and an excellent Mandarin department. Uh, and our classics department offers courses in both ancient Greek and Latin. And then, as I said, we also, uh, students are able to take Arabic uh, courses through this uh, collaborative program that we have with Lewis and Clark. So there's a number of different languages that are offered here that people can take and we strongly encourage our students to take some foreign language while they're here. Um, and so that's sort of why we have that foreign language requirement. But knowing a language, being fluent in another language is not really part, uh, it's not really a necessary part of linguistics. Um, as a linguist, I don't speak any languages other than English fluently. Um, I, was, I was an exchange student in Sweden for a year, so I speak a little bit of Swedish, but I'm nowhere near fluent in the language. Um, and I also don't speak Malagasy, the language that I work on fluently. I kind of have a smattering of that language, but I don't speak it fluently. Uh, and the same is true for lots of other languages. I know a little bit of French, I know a little bit of German, I know a little bit of Russian, I know a little bit of Mandarin. Uh, uh, a little bit of Italian, but I don't speak any of these languages fluently. Uh, being a fluent speaker of another language is, it's a useful skill to have for a linguist, but it's not a necessary skill. We're sort of more interested in um, uh, our, our, I mean, the, our, our discipline is really more about understanding what is in the minds of speakers that allows them to speak and understand languages. That's kind of the approach that we take to this. And um, uh, our assumption is that studying that question doesn't require being fluent necessarily in the language that you're studying. In fact, sometimes having an outsider's perspective can be useful. Uh, uh, a lot of the students in our program who are bilingual um, report that it's, it can sometimes be difficult for them to think about their, their other language from a linguistic perspective. Uh, it's kind of easier for them to think about the syntactic structure or the phonological structure of some language that is completely foreign to them, uh, as opposed to a language that they grew up speaking. It can be what, one of the things that we try and, and, uh, and, and do with our students is to make a, all of this tacit knowledge that we have of our languages uh, to make as much of it as possible conscious, because these are, these are um, things that we don't necessarily have conscious knowledge of. Uh, and being fluent in the language doesn't necessarily give you any more access to conscious knowledge of how that language is structured uh, than, you know, studying it from the outside. So it's 
it's good to know other languages and we build that into our major. Uh, but it's not a requirement to know other languages. A linguist is not the same thing as a polyglot. A linguist is not the same thing as someone who speaks lots of languages. And any linguist that you talk to will have stories about how when people ask them, oh, what do you do for a living? And they say, you say, I'm a linguist. The first question they ask is, oh, how many languages do you speak? We hate that question. That, ugh, that question drives us crazy because that's kind of beside the point. Right? Um, uh, Emerson asks, uh, what sort of jobs do linguistics majors at Reed go on to? This is a great question. Um, there, um, uh, so a certain number of our uh, uh, graduates go on to do graduate work in linguistics, um, but it's a minority, I would say. Um, we're, uh, we're graduating eight students this year, uh, assuming everybody finishes their thesis. Uh, sorry, nine students this year. Um, and uh, in any given year, maybe one, two, or three of our graduates will go on to do graduate work in a, in a master's or PhD program in, in linguistics. Uh, this year we have four students who are going on to uh, graduate work. Not all of them are students who are graduating this year. In fact, most of them are students who graduated last year and then they took a year off before, uh, before going to graduate school. Um, but that's a record number. Um, some of our students will go into fields that are kind of adjacent to linguistics. So uh, we've had students, we had uh, one student, for instance, who wrote her read thesis about sci uh, American Sign Language. She was very interested in how questions are formed in sign language. And um, uh, so she, to gather data, she worked with uh, 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 native uh, ASL signers and also sign language interpreters. And in the course of that, she got to know a bunch of sign language interpreters and became really interested in the idea of becoming an interpreter herself. So she took uh, uh, ASL, uh, so after, uh, while she was at Reed, she took ASL classes at a community college in, the, in, the, in, the, in Portland. Uh, and she continued with her ASL studies uh, after graduation and eventually became a sign language interpreter. Um, I think now, actually, she's gone back to graduate school, but in psychology rather than in linguistics. Um, we've also had some students who've gone into uh, various tech fields. So they've be, their interest is in um, computer science uh, and uh, its relationship to language. Unfortunately, computational linguistics is not something that we offer at Reed. We're just too small of a department to offer that. But as I said, Reed for small liberal arts colleges is, is uh, almost unique in having a linguistics uh, department. And we also have a, a really good computer science program here as well. So uh, students who come to Reed can study, can't study computational linguistics, unfortunately, but they can study linguistics and they can study computer science kind of in parallel with one another uh, and then use those two sets of skills to, um, to go in various directions uh, in the tech field. So linguists are in high demand in, in tech field for things like um, artificial intelligence research or um, sort of teaching computers to, uh, uh, to produce and understand human language better. Using computational techniques to uh, study um, uh, how human language works. I'll give you just one example of that. So um, at uh, the Oregon Health Sciences University, which is our large medical school here in Portland, uh, there's a group who are doing a research project. I don't know if it's still going on, but it was a multi-year project where they were using, um, the, uh, so the, there was some research to suggest that when uh, people are in the early stages of developing Alzheimer's disease, uh, it can affect their language production. So it can make subtle changes to the way in which they produce sentence structures uh, if they're in the early stages of Alzheimer's. And the important thing with treating Alzheimer's is that you want to diagnose it early, right? So uh, the earlier you diagnose Alzheimer's, the better treatment you can offer for people who are suffering from that disease. So uh, uh, medical researchers are constantly looking for ways to diagnose somebody with Alzheimer's as early as possible so that they can start treatment as early as possible. So this initial research suggesting that um, having Alzheimer's affects how you talk 
um, led this research team to wonder, well, I wonder if we could teach computers to, you know, if we make sort of make recordings of patients and teach computers to analyze those recordings, can we, uh, you know, can we teach computers basically to identify whether somebody is, is at early risk for acquiring Alzheimer's? So that's an example of a kind of unexpected sort of medical application that the interaction between linguistics and computers um, uh, might offer. We also have actually, though, lots of majors who go into fields that have nothing whatsoever to do with linguistics. They, you know, they, they're passionate about linguistics, they're passionate about human language, um, but it's not something that they want to do for a career. They're interested in our department, they're interested in our major because it's small, we have a great sense of community, um, and you know, we have interesting classes on interesting topics that, that uh, allow people to sort of think about the world uh, and their place within it in a, in a very unique way. Uh, but, you know, once they're finished with Reed, they may not be interested in pursuing linguistics as a career. And so we've had students who've graduated from our program who've gone on to become uh, political activists, um, uh, uh, administrative uh, aides, uh, veterinarians, um, EMTs, uh, a chef, one of our graduates became a chef. Um, uh, some of our graduates went on to, to uh, pursue entrepreneurial careers. So there's, been, there's a, quite a wide variety um, of uh, fields that people have gone into. Um, uh, um, question from... Uh, um, Luce, I hope I'm saying that right. Luce or Luce or Luce. Um, do you study any particular singing techniques in relation to language, for instance, Mongolian throat singing? Ha! Huh. Interesting question. Um, so, um, not directly, but uh, that might be something that, with the right spin, could be pursued as a thesis topic, for example, in the domain of um, uh, phonetics, perhaps. There's certainly a lot of overlap uh, between the study of uh, phonetics and the study of singing in regard to the fact that they both, you know, use the same anatomy, right? The same uh, part of the vocal tract. Um, so I'm sure that there were, uh, you know, I don't study uh, singing techniques. I don't think anyone in the department directly studies this. Uh, but it's something that I think could be studied under the rubric of uh, uh, linguistics. And there's, there's um, some interesting overlaps between language and music that um, some linguists are interested in. Um, there's no uh, escaping the fact that of the species of uh, organisms on Earth, human beings are the only species that has language and human beings are the only species that has music. And some people have hypothesized that these two capacities are related to one another, that um, our ability to use language is sort of what created our ability to appreciate music or maybe vice versa, I don't know, or maybe the two things sort of evolved in the species in parallel to one another. Um, and some interesting work has been done on, on the relationships or, or lack thereof between uh, our, uh, how language is stored in the brain and our, our, our intuitions about language versus how music is stored in the brain and intuitions about music. I think more of that work is being done in psychology than is being done in linguistics per se, but uh, I know that some linguists have been interested in that. Um, uh, Sabrina asks, uh, what are some of the more interesting out there theses that have come out of your department? Well, so let me think about this. Uh, so, um, the, and, and the ones that are the most interesting are not necessarily the ones that are the most out there <laughs> and vice versa. Sometimes an out there thesis is not as successful as we would like. But um, uh, let me think of some interesting theses that we've had. So, um, uh, we had a thesis, uh, well, so one of the theses that I'm, advising this year, as I said, is about Turkish sign language. This is interesting to me because Turkish sign language is, is a particular 
uh, uh, sign language that has not been widely studied. In case you don't know, there are probably, there are hundreds if not thousands of sign languages that are used all throughout the world and they are as different from one another as any two spoken languages are from each other. So they each need to sort of be studied uh, independently of the others. Turkish Sign Language has its own structure that is quite different from the structure of, say, American Sign Language. Uh, and this particular thesis writer is working on uh, sort of artistic expression in Turkish Sign Language. So thinking about, um, they're looking at a series of YouTube videos that were put out by a native Turkish signer uh, where that sign language user was taking um, uh, popular films in Turkey and sort of retelling them in Turkish sign language so that they would be more accessible to, an, to a deaf audience in, in Turkey. So sort of reenacting these movies in sign language. Uh, and uh, my thesis student is looking at how they go about doing that. How do you sort of take a, uh, a, a movie and uh, kind of retell it in sign language? Are there particular kind of cinematic techniques that you can use in sign language to sort of convey uh, what's going on in a particular scene that might be different from how people might use sign language when they're having an, a, an everyday conversation with a friend, for instance? Um, what are some other uh, good theses? Um, so, uh, um, one of the students last year was, uh, this was the student who went to Beirut as, a, as an exchange student. She became very interested in the fact that, so in Beirut, um, uh, everybody speaks Arabic, uh, but you also tend to learn a European language in school, uh, but there's a kind of two different uh, camps in Beirut. Some people go to French school and, and, and learn French and they might go to French university and others learn English and might go to English speaking university. And she was interested in the differences between the English speaking Beirut, uh, Beirutis and the French speaking Beirutis in terms of how they use their Arabic. Uh, what aspects of, uh, and in particular she was interested in people who went to French university and tended to use a kind of French R sound when they produced their Arabic words, uh, which was a, a sort of interesting affectation that they used. And she uh, went to Beirut and interviewed a bunch of uh, Beirutis who, who did this particular thing with their French Rs uh, and sort of studied kind of how they sort of viewed their identity as members, as, as Arabs, as people from Lebanon, as members of the French speaking world because uh, for a while uh, Lebanon was a was a, a a French colony, I think, right? So so there's some sort of historical connection to France, um, and that was that was a very interesting thesis. Uh, let me think if I can uh, think of one more example of a cool thesis. Um, so. Uh, um, uh, well, I'll, I'll, just, I'll just mention another thesis that I'm advising this year. <laughs> uh, the theses that I'm working on right now, obviously, are, are at the top of my brain. Uh, but um, before I, I, I get into this, I should say that we've got a really good website <laughs> for our linguistics department. And one of the pages on our website is uh, a list of all of the thesis titles uh, for every thesis that has ever been written in linguistics. So if you want to get a better sense of kind of the range of thesis topics that people have worked on, I would go to that page and just scan down and take a look at some of the titles. Um, but this uh, other thesis that I'm, I'm advising this year uh, is about uh, a, um, um, a particular kind of construction that occurs in colloquial English, but not really in formal English, where people use, in, in if clauses, uh, people use extra haves. So instead of saying, um, if I had gone to the store, I would have, you know, uh, picked up some milk. They'll say things like, if I had have gone to the store with an extra have in there, if I had have gone to the store, which is something that, you know, you're not supposed to write in a formal essay, but people produce that extra have when they talk all the time. And uh, this particular thesis student is trying to understand the semantics of that. So when do people say, if I had gone to the store versus if I had have gone to the store? What determines the difference between that? Or if I had have gone to the store versus if I would have gone to the store? 
and sort of trying to uh, construct a formal theory to explain some of the differences in meaning between these different kinds of if clauses. That's a sort of more esoteric kind of topic, but uh, interesting to me at least. Um, what was my thesis about, asks Danielle. So my thesis was about Swedish. Uh, it was about um, a particular construction in Swedish uh, called the S passive. Um, let me see if I can explain this in a simple way. Uh, so um, a passive construction is one, well, so if we take a simple sentence like, um, uh, the girl wrote the letter, you can make a passive equivalent of that sentence. The letter was written by the girl where the thing that um, the, the, the patient of the action, the letter is made into the subject of the sentence. Uh, that's, an, that's what's called a passive construction. Uh, in Swedish, the way in which you do this construction is by taking the verb and adding a little suffix called S onto the end of it. Um, and um, I was interested in this construction because it's also used in a bunch of other contexts besides forming passive. So I was interested in the question of why does this particular construction have so many different uses? And I was trying to determine whether there was kind of a unified pattern to all of those uses, right? Um, so very early on, I was interested in kind of the, the esoteric sentence, uh, uh, sentence structure questions, I suppose. Um, um, again, I can get into more detail with that if anybody is, is interested in the morbid details uh, but that's sort of a general overview. Um, that's all the questions I'm seeing on, on the chat at the moment, but maybe you guys have additional questions for me. What else have I not covered that you're morbidly curious about? Uh, what does allied field mean in terms of the linguistics major? That's a question from Miles. Uh, so yes. So, um, the allied field, it's essentially like a minor, basically. Uh, every linguistics major, in addition to taking courses in linguistics and the foreign language courses that I talked about before, is also expected to take uh, a minimum of four courses in some other discipline that's offered at Reed that they can become sort of a secondary expert in. The idea is that linguistics, the study of human language, we feel is inherently interdisciplinary. Uh, that is to say, it draws in ideas, it draws in methodologies, it draws in theoretical traditions from all sorts of different fields, whether it be mathematics, logic, psychology, biology, sociology, anthropology, history, uh, literature and language, we kind of pull in ideas from all of these different disciplines. So we want our linguistics majors to have the opportunity to take uh, multiple courses in uh, some discipline as well as just linguistics. Um, uh, we're not the only department to have an allied field requirement. I think the psychology department has something similar and uh, the anthropology department has something similar. Um, uh, essentially, it's up to the student to decide what uh, allied field they would like um, to, to select. We have some that we list as kind of usual choices or typical choices, and they include things like uh, 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 math, philosophy, psychology, anthropology, uh, literature, and foreign language. Those are probably the most popular choices of allied field. But really, we accept any, uh, any discipline as an allied field if you can make the case that studying that discipline will inform your understanding of human language in some way or another. So we've also had students who've done things like physics as an allied field, if they were interested in acoustics, for instance, or music or theater. Uh, those have been chosen as allied fields by different people. Art history, uh, dance. Um, uh, um, economics, political science, history, um, uh, all of these have been chosen as, as allied fields by students. It's, it's actually pretty uncommon to, I mean, I, I can't think of very many uh, read majors that would not make good allied fields. Maybe chemistry would not be a good allied field uh, for a linguistics major. 
uh, but it's hard to think of others. Um, um, so uh, it's the, the 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 rationale for it is to is to make sure that students have a kind of interdisciplinary experience as part of being a, a, a linguistics major, and the um, uh, the choice of allied field is up to the student. Uh, and then a final thing I'll say about the allied field is that the allied field does not have to be integrated necessarily into what you do in the linguistics department. So for instance, you don't have to um, uh, combine your allied field with your linguistics courses in selecting a thesis topic, for example. Some people do that. Uh, they might uh, have, uh, say, Chinese as their allied field and because they want to write a topic on something to do with Chinese syntax for their thesis. But it's not always the case. My allied field was anthropology. My read thesis had nothing whatsoever to do with anthropology. I was just kind of interested in anthropology as a secondary interest. Um, I think uh, uh, I'm getting a message from Shalini that I think we have to wrap things up in the interest of time. So uh, I'll just leave you with two things. One, again, we've got a nice website. Uh, uh, if you go to the read web page and click on academics at the top of the page, you'll find our page and you'll be able to click through and see more about how our major is set up, more about our lab. Uh, there are some photos you can look at of our lab since you're not able to tour the lab in person, unfortunately. You can find out more about me and my colleagues by looking at our web pages. You can find out more about read theses by, uh, looking at the, uh, the web page that, uh, that, um, Luce gave us the URL for, um, et, et cetera, et cetera. And then also on that page, you can find my email address. So if you have follow-up questions for me, um, go ahead and shoot me an email. I'm happy to answer emails from prospective students. So don't, fee don't be shy about reaching out to me. Um, if I can't answer your question, I'll, um, I'll forward your email to someone else in the department who can answer your question. Uh, or to someone in the admissions office who can answer your question, but don't don't feel shy, feel shy about reaching out to me if you have if you think of additional things that you'd like to ask. All right, so I'll turn things back over to Shalini. Thank you, thank you, Professor. That was a fascinating and and thought provoking faculty office hours, I, and I'm I'm also grateful to all of you for uh, for joining us for it. I want to mention one thing in particular that Matt mentioned, which was. Uh, how, how the department creates community among its majors as well. Uh, and I just want to encourage all of you to think about that as you're, you're doing the, the good and the important work of researching the academics of a college and of a department and its, its opportunities in terms of research and, and so forth and study abroad. Those are all wonderful questions that you're asking and important things to, to be thinking about. And I also invite you to think about the kind of community you'll be joining as well. Uh, that's something that can really kind of be distinctive from, from place to place. And I hope in the last uh, hour or so that you've gotten a glimpse into what the community among linguistics majors at Reed and, 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 and all of our students really uh, is like. And I hope that'll inform some, some of your decision making as well. So again, thank you for joining us. Uh, if you do have any other questions, don't hesitate to reach out. I hope you all are, are staying home and staying safe. and. Uh, and when we look forward to staying in touch with you virtually, of course. Um, so thank you, everyone. <laughs>